people that have really gone very far with their life and I feel like maybe I'm one of them anyway but um, I like to share it with them and she said I have connection for you that ne needs to see these paintings and uh, of course she's well she's a great connection anyway for me and I want to say thank you Melissa that was really sweet of you um, but the paintings I guess spoke for themselves which I feel I'm very blessed with the talent I have and I showed them to Nicola she was actually in Little Rock and I kept calling and I was so persistent that her her assistant said well she's in Little Rock right now and I don't even remember the assistant's name which is awful but um, she said I'll call her and see if she'll see you and so she did she called me back Nicola did and I went I said oh let me bring them down here to you she was at the Clinton Center and I said I'll just run them down do you have a moment that you could see them and it was real windy that day and I came down and and Nicola runs out to the car and I'm thinking she thinks I'm full-blown crazy she just wants to get me off her back you know well I opened the the back of the car and it's blowing and all this and trying to get these paintings out and she looks in and she goes oh my gosh we've got to have those and I'm thinking okay I'll never see this lady again she just you know pulling my leg <laughs> and afterwards she called me a few days later and said I'm really interested I think the museum could use these. We have an, a new series going, including the arts, and we're trying to connect the museum with that. And I thought, great. So that's how it all started. I don't know where you at. I, I had that image in my mind of how I met Nicola. And, um, and when you met Nicola, you had not actually visited the sixth floor. No, okay. I hadn't, no. And what did you think on your first visit actually touring the museum? Oh yeah, that's what you had asked me. Well. I was a little bit overwhelmed because I was meeting with them and I had some paintings here but then they sent me upstairs and I had my friend Heather with me and we had I wanted to have the little earphone on and listen to this whole story and I started going around and everything came alive it's just so well done although I didn't realize how much time it would take to really take it all in and be in front of each display and, and read about it and watch the movies. And so I realized I'm gonna have to cut my time with a few places. And when I saw that corner room, that's, uh, well, it's really beyond words. I don't know what to say. It. it I had to stand there a while and just look at that and say this is where he stood and shot his gun. I, I just, and I remember, okay, see there's a, a, a place at the time when Oswald was scoping at the president, all right? And I wanted to see that. I wanted to see if that tree was still the same way because the leaves were still on the trees at the time. And he had looked through and they watched and they said the shot, the one that killed JFK, wait, he waited until it went beyond the tree and then there was a little opening and that's where he shot. And I wanted to see that. What, what in the world could somebody be thinking? And how cold could he be? to do something like that. I just remember the light. It, it was almost the same time of day, too, while I was up there. Yeah. The trees have grown quite a bit since 1960. I noticed that. Yeah. Anyway, um, I just, I really liked going through there. I liked seeing the conspiracy theories, mainly because I believe there's a whole lot more to it also. 
in going away from that. Uh, so, so I, in doing the the paintings, have you sort of become a student of this? Have you read more about it in recent years? Oh my gosh, yes, yes, and learned so much about his background and and his life before, and how much of a playboy he was, and just you know he. he the, the world made him and the universe and God and everything put him together to be in a certain spot. I truly believe that. After reading about his, his um, boat capsizing and being hit and capsizing um, and then the coconut where he sent that, all these little things fit together and you can see that it, it made him into the person that he became and what he stood for. Do you consider your uh, Kennedy pieces your, your finest work? I wouldn't say that they're my finest work. I hope that my finest work is, you know, well, down the road, sure, yeah. Sure. Are there more uh, Kennedy pieces in your future, you think? Well, I did one after I left the museum, and that was because I felt like there was one missing. And I had to do it. So right now, I don't see that there's another one there, but who knows, there, there may be. Does it surprise you that now, 51 years after the assassination, that there's still so many people that come to this site that are still interested in the subject from around the world? Mm -hmm. I had no idea. <laughs> I really, I had no idea. I was up there seeing the display and it was crowded. I was so surprised. Yes, it's, it is surprising. Well, I want to take you down to collection storage and we have your paintings out and I want to have the chance on camera to talk to you about specific ones and uh, what you can share with me about them is before we wrap up this portion of it is there anything I've left out any other stories or memories you want to share with us I, I can't think of anything you're pretty good and thorough All thank right. you well, we will regroup downstairs in just a few minutes thank you okay we're down here in our collection storage area and we have your paintings out and uh, is this the first one Actually, yes, this is the first one I started with. Uh, this is the one I did in the class. Right. <laughs> and uh, everyone vaguely knew who Jackie Kennedy was. They sure did. <laughs> they sure did. Um, now, was this based on a particular photograph? Yes, this one that I found in the Life magazine. Okay. And one that I remember. Now, tell us a little bit about your style, uh, as far as you didn't reproduce the photograph exactly. There's a sort of a wispiness about it. It's it's almost like it's out of focus slightly. How mm -hmm. did, why did you why did you go that route? To me, there was a way that I had to fade it, because the series is named Fading Memories, and to make it not as clear. I had to go over the painting somewhat and found that that was a good way to make it look vague and like it was in a, a past memory of sorts. I also have a little bit of influence by Gerhard Richter and he is also, um, he's shown some work much more faded than this and gone through. He'll rake it across. So I realized that was an influence after the fact, and yet it connected me with this. I'm, I had, I had to make it a little more clear at the time. I see that the, the the horizontal lines and the vertical lines on this. How did you achieve that? With a brush, actually, a very okay. soft brush. Okay. And what happens is when you get a thicker area of oil paint, uh, it will drag it across. And some areas are not as thick. In fact, some areas don't even have paint on it at all. You can see my underpainting yeah. uh, through here. And so you just drag it and uh, yeah. create an effect there. Mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's move over here to uh, John Jr. Uh, Katie, could you call Megan and let her know that we're down here? Yeah. She, wanted to, she wanted to be here for some of this. All right, John Jr. I did very quickly 
and it actually came out much more ethereal, I, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, because of, of, of the time frame that I did this in, there was more wet paint. And, and I took a softer brush because by, by this time I went, I don't really want the lines in there. I want to use something else. So I took a softer and wider brush and started brushing through it. And when I was finished and went, stood back, this little wing, it looks like an angel wing, came out. And I thought, well, that's so appropriate because he looks like a little angel saluting his daddy. And I love the little socks, the little white socks there. But this is his mom here, and this is Robert, actually Robert's leg, standing behind him. Pause real quick. All right, let's see. So this is Caroline Kennedy. Yes, it the, is. Uh, in the Capitol Rotunda. Tell us about this. Right. Uh, this is actually, the image includes her mother over here, the true image does. Uh, and yet I didn't feel like that was as important as where Caroline was at the time. Caroline is not faded out like I did on the other uh, paintings because she is not a, a memory. She's alive and still a part of our world at this time. Uh, this is her father's casket, her little hand, gloved hand, holding on to the railing, her little white socks. Um, this is very much something that I saw growing up, growing up Catholic, uh, the image. So the rest of it is faded out because right. he is gone. And you felt a, a connection to Caroline because you were close to her age and... and yeah, uh, very much so, right. yeah. yeah. Alright, so why don't we turn around here and uh, do you want to look at the, uh, the coconut or, or do you want to do the... Let me see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the coconut would be appropriate right okay. now. Okay, we'll step over there and I'll follow you Because we here. can jump and then go to the... Sure. Do you want me to move the Zapruder frame out of the... Or yeah, let's do that last. That's and I was going to put gloves on, but I guess <laughs> <laughs> the artist touches nah. it, it's all right. Nah. Okay. All right, so the coconut. You were telling me about, uh, as you learned more about President Kennedy yeah. uh, and his background, uh, you were intrigued by the coconut that he kept on his desk. This is, this is great. I've got to see this in real life sometime. Anyway, when, when he, was, uh, he was on his boat and it capsized, it was hit, and he found a way to get back a message to a British outpost. And, that was, and this was after a lot of things happened, as we all know, that, that are interested. Uh, and he wrote into because the natives found him and he had no way of communicating with them. So he wrote a note, inscribed it into the coconut and had the natives take it to the British outpost and that's how they found he and his men. Right. And I just love it because I love doing this and I love that it says, I can see, I forgot about this, the native, I can see some of the message that it said, but anyway, it told them the British outpost told, it, it said, the native knows our position, and it said pause it instead of spelling it completely out, so. Now, you mentioned to me earlier that you felt like his whole life was sort of on this fixed path towards Dallas, and where, where do you see his experiences during World War II with the coconut and PT-109 in that, in that timeline? How do you feel that that was part of his destiny? He actually saved his whole crew. And he found a way 